Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is a session about providing access to mental health services in poor and low-income countries. My name is Josh Goldstein. I'm a retired vice president at Axion, the microfinance provider, where I work to ensure that persons with disability had access to micro, micro credit in countries like India and Bangladesh and Ecuador and other places. Uh, towards the end of my stint there, I became very aware that persons with psychosocial disabilities who are invisible were largely left out of these programs and that led to a broader inquiry on what was happening in terms of the enforcement of the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disability when it came to persons with psychosocial disabilities. And what I learned uh, was that in the, when the treaty was debated, while there are clear articles around access to medical services, mental health services, it's largely be de be been de-emphasized as a treaty obligation. So I'm particularly delighted that the Zero Conference has taken this on in this, uh, this year because it's been largely uh, ne neglected and overlooked. So the question is why is that? And the reason is it's, it's understandable that in a treaty that looks at uh, legal capacity and the deprival of legal capacity that affected people with disability, mental health disabilities, when you looked at uh, the abuses of psychiatry, the, which led to forced, uh, forced confinement, that voice, and a very important voice, ended up overshadowing the appropriate uses of, of psych psychiatry and psychosocial interventions. Uh, as a treaty obligation. And so we don't want a change in the language of the treaty. We, what we want to remedy is the enforcement so that country reports will be uh, emphasizing this. My own view is uh, that while we talk about globally, maybe 15% of persons have disabilities, if you added people with psychosocial disabilities, and particularly in poor countries, there are almost no good indicators on that we're probably talking more about 20%. Um, and these people are largely un unidentified, living alone in isolated lives. And my colleagues here today are some of the pioneers who are trying to change this uh, unfortunate narrative of the neglect of persons with psychosocial disabilities by providing mental health services. Uh, and we're delighted that Enosh in Israel is here. Welcome, thank you for all you're doing. Uh, uh, my colleagues from what used to be called Handicap International uh, are doing work uh, in Lebanon in a refugee camp. This is very, very exciting. But we need to all work as advocates to get the tr convention and the treaty and at the UN meetings to really focus on this issue. Just as access to wheelchairs or hearing aids are, are important, so is access to mental health services. I think another reason that it's been neglected is that outcomes are much less clear. If you give somebody a wheelchair, they have a wheelchair, that's success. But what is success when you have treatments? And we are at a stage in, in our in our, our medical history where we still know very little about the human brain. So outcomes are uncertain, but that doesn't mean one doesn't try. And in many low-income countries, there aren't even words for depression, anxiety. So these things uh, need much greater visibility. And, and because, again, of this issue of the abuses of psychiatry in countries where they need it most, the, the, the message that I think many people in these countries have gotten is to avoid this area when it comes to treaty enforcement. We're trying to change that. My speakers here today uh, will, will address it. And I really hope uh, we'll have some, some questions. We have also have a, 
a woman in Kazakhstan here who's doing some great work. Uh, but this is, we want to th again thank the Zero, uh, Zero Project for really taking this on. And uh, uh, thank you very much. And I'll stop there and I hope we'll have uh, time for some questions. So let us turn to our first speaker, who is a, a gentleman uh, from Bhutan, where he's the only psychiatrist uh, in the whole. Good afternoon. Thank you, ISIL Foundation and Zero Project for giving us this platform this afternoon. And thank you for coming. This so let me begin by just uh, introducing myself. So uh, do I know how to do it? Sorry, this is the wrong one. I think I got the wrong one. Sorry, I need some help with this, but uh, let me s just say something about, can you help with this? Uh, I'm the first Bhutanese trained psychiatrist, and I've been in this business for the past uh, 25 years. And uh, my becoming a psychiatrist was not so much out of uh, option, but out of necessity. Um, I belonged to a family with two schizophrenic siblings. My father was violent and alcoholic, and he was quite... Uh, uh, but quite violent to my mother, and my mother became very severely depressed towards the end of her life. And uh, so that's uh, the background on which I, I, I have. Um, right yes, now I'll get it, all right. Um, so it's been my sort of a lifelong passion or a mission to do something about mental health in Bhutan. Especially this uh, gentleman to my uh, right or left is my brother who was schizophrenic and locked up in the house for almost 12 years because we didn't really have much of a treatment for him. And it's only when I became a doctor that I started looking after him. And now he's a useful member of my family. Um, Bhutan is special in many ways because we, were in, uh, an, we are an independent country sandwiched between two giants, uh, China and India. And we started a development uh, quite late in our history in the late in the 1960s, uh, with the development philosophy of gross national happiness, which has fortunately has spread worldwide now. And what essentially means development with some human values, not just at the cost of increasing a gross domestic product, but also including happiness and humanity with our development. Mental care service in Bhutan has started only in the last de two decades or so, and I actually started from scratch. So our project was, how do we introduce these modern concepts of mental health, mental disorders, and all this lexicon and jargon into a traditional society, which Josh mentions that we don't have terminologies or concepts called depression and schizophrenia and bipolar. So it's a very challenging uh, uh, situation, and more so because we have a very intact traditional culture, also with shamanism and belief in spirits and ghosts and deities and so many other players in this field, it is quite a challenge for people to actually accept modern treatment. And when they do come to us, they actually look for miracles, or almost instantaneous results, which also becomes a bit of a challenge. Um, but the good thing with Bhutan is we have a very good primary healthcare infrastructure. And so we decided to introduce men mental health services by, by what we call as a community-based approach, by training our health workers and also embedding our services right in the community and not centralizing or make, making big hospitals as such. So the innovative part of this project was we would go into the community, the core team of trainers, psychiatrists, psychologists, and other nurses that will go to the community, gather the community leaders, and shamans and some of the traditional healers, and we would actually discuss with them what sort of issues they have. And then we would actually teach them a little bit about the concepts of depression and schizophrenia, alcoholism, suicide, which are not very difficult to describe, actually. I mean, everybody knows mad is a mad person or whatever, or alcoholic or suicide, so not so difficult. 
the difficult part is with depression and, uh, and a bit of anxiety, I suppose, but uh, most of them are quite clear cut that it's not so difficult. So we would help in identifying those cases in the community. And then uh, along with that, we also try train the local health workers. And so it, it is a sort of a combo, a combination of case finding, training, and also initiating treatment at the grassroots level in consultation with uh, our, um, uh, our community uh, uh, leaders as well as the community members. What is the impact we had? Yes, um, initially when I started, uh, the cases that came to me are mostly referred by my medical colleagues. But today I'm very happy to know that a lot of people are actually coming to me and saying, Doctor, I saw you on the television saying something about depression, and I think I'm, I'm getting something like this. So slowly we are actually getting away from this stigma, the discrimination, the shame, and uh, you know, so one of the challenges we have is our people are very sensitive to drugs, psychotropic drugs, and they, they, they'd improve in two to three weeks, even acute psychotic episodes of bipolar. But what is problem is they think then, then they're cured and they will stop treatment. So it takes at least about a couple of years for our patients to really accept that what they have is a chronic illness and they need to be maintained on medication. So one of the success stories I have is a young man who became blind. He was an orphan, raised by an un only uncle. Uncle died, he lost his eyesight, and he came to this hospital that I work there. And the other fellow is another blind man, he's a physiotherapist, my friend. Two of us uh, somehow counseled him, he was having a breakdown. And we sent him to the only blind school in Bhutan. And now he has graduated from there, and he has, become, he has opened up a music school for the, for the, for the blind in Bhutan which I think is, very, is a success uh, story. Of course, we have challenges, as is every, everywhere. But the biggest ch challenge is, of course, the modernization, the rural-urban migration, and the enemy effect of rapid social changes in a society. So we are getting suicides, and our suicide rate is almost uh, touching or, or be going beyond the global rate, which is not so nice for a GNH country. And I, I, I have to be an activist sometimes. To the other issue is we provide a lot of free services in Bhutan. And because free service, the people don't have much rights over, over there when you give free services. And there's a tendency for health workers to be complacent and not re, re, become very effective. So what will be the next steps? So obviously we have a young democracy and um, uh, the new government that we have installed uh, late 2018. They have now have a focus of shifting the development projects to the grassroots levels in so much that they're going to actually allocate more than half the funding to the grassroots level. So we actually need to work with the local leaders now to put mental health and these uh, human uh, uh, issues at the mainstream of development. So far we have been mostly engrossed in infrastructure and other uh, uh, things, but we are hoping that we can capitalize on this uh, change in leadership and change in policies. We of course need to continue to improve our human capacity and we need to strengthen and go after health workers one or two time training is no good unless you go after them and make sure that they are supervised and they are also doing delivering work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chen Cho, and I'm delighted that Tam will now speak about her great work in Vietnam. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Tam Nguyen from Basic Need Vietnam. So now I'm going to share with you about our project on depression management and microfinance loan. And we provide treatment for everyone, but our uh, uh, target group, mostly we uh, provide treatment for poor women uh, with depression. So uh, we 
uh, use the spirit of our founder, Chris Underhill, that we use rights-based approach. We put people, we maintain in this in the center of our, our, of our system. So what they need, we provide, it's not like a, people have psychotic, we send to psychotic, uh, uh, to the psychotic treatment, people have depression, we send to depression treatment. But what they need, we provide in the holistic approach that best address the need, but is feasible with the system. And so we start our depression care project in 2010, and we adapt the model that Chris developed to make it more suitable with the low and middle income country like Vietnam. So why we focus on depression? Because we all know that depression is the most common mental condition, and it's more than sadness. It's like you, you lose all the pleasure in all the things that you can enjoy in life, you have no energy, you have poor concentration, so it's highly disabled and it's invisible because you cannot work, you cannot enjoy life, but it's invisible. And even that people don't think that they have the, the problem, they don't know where to seek help. And uh, the prevalence in women is so much higher, like two to three times higher, and it comorbid with other problems like anxiety and somatic problem. People feel uh, headaches, uh, stomach, I heart problem, but it's not really a, a condition that relates to physical problem, but it's mental problem. And even a lot of uh, scientific research shows that it's highly treatable, but the service is not available. So what to do? And the treatment gap is huge. So some say that it's like a 50%, but actually it's more than 90% in some other papers. So what we need to do? To, to, to address. So more than 55% no treatment. The capacity of the healthcare system is good. Like, so we use the same approach like uh, our colleagues in Bhutan. We integrate mental healthcare into uh, um, community, community based system. This is the only way that makes the service available, uh, acceptable. And the treatment cost is not too high. So later, when we withdraw the project, the project will be able to sustain afterward. But like I mentioned before, people don't know that this is a problem. So we have to raise the awareness so that people know where to seek help and what can be done. And also the community leaders, they know that this is something can be done to raise the well-being of the people in the community. And also, it's a good uh, uh, way to reduce the stigma because if we can treat the problem, we can bring more opportunity for people to improve their capacity, improve their life, so it will reduce the stigma a lot. And mental health is never in the priority list, so what needs to be done? And gender inequity and poverty make it worse, so we have to break the circle, so it will address the need in a very holistic way. So what we do? very much like what he mentioned, we build capacity from grassroots level to the higher level. So the people at the village level know to screen people, at high risk people who stay in house all the time, sad, have uh, a lot of problem in their life. Uh, so this is the people at the high risk. So we train the people at the village to detect the problem to screen and then refer people to the higher level and we treat the higher level, community health station, psychiatric hospital to provide the treatment. But we have to uh, engage with our partners, so they want to do the project. And we do very uh, uh, serious research to gather the information that to prove that our project works. This is the best, the, the, the best way to uh, engage with the partner and to motivate them. So uh, now our psychiatry hospital, not only medication, not hospital, but they know psychotherapy, they want to do outreach to support the lower level. The lower level, at the village level, they can detect depression, and they send people to higher level for treatment. And mostly it's a talking treatment, and people uh, uh, either receive individual treatment or group treatment, but our poor women, they gather in the group. They know how to improve their mood, they know how to be more active, and I know how to problem solve. Not only problem solve their low mood, low energy, but also problem solve their poverty, their relationship problem. 
and women union uh, in Vietnam is a very, very uh, vibrant organization. They support women all over the country. They do social support, but they very hesitate to work with the mental health. Uh, they share with me very often, I, I very much want to support crazy people, but I don't really know how. So, so now, with our treatment, they are very actively involved and especially actively in the life of part. And this is very, very strong message that help reduce the stigma. And because we don't have enough psychiatry to, to touch, to, to provide treatment for like uh, one third of the population. So we have to base on non-medical, non-hand uh, people to provide treatment and make it uh, good quality with our appropriate technical support. So women union now say very confidently uh, screening and refer people up and actively involved in supporting people with psychosocial uh, disability to do their livelihoods through their own existing uh, system. And our, and our patients, they, they uh, improve greatly in terms of mood, in terms of the activity, and also in terms of the income. So uh, now, again, we can confirm through our research that uh, depression and poverty at the same time, if we address it appropriately, can we break the circle and we address two things at the same time. And we improve the effectiveness of both programs, handcare program and microfinance and life program, because before two systems work vertically, no collaboration. But if they collaborate, the effectiveness is so much better, that the outcome on patient is so much better. And we reduce the stigma, as we can see our group facilitator and all the group that sit in the room very uh, happily. This is not the first session. The first session, most of them cry. But now we will picture it in the third session or the last session. And some of the success story, I give the quote of everyone, like the leader of the Women Union, uh, the community facilitator, and uh, patient. So the patient, she, she says, since uh, the group is the most supportive thing in my life. Even my husband and my son remind me to come to the group every week because they notice how happy I am. And also the other member of the family is also uh, feeling that there's great improvement. Uh, since my wife joined the group, she became more active, confident, and cheerful. I'm very happy. Oop. So. This is a picture of the, our patient. You can see their smiles. It tells more than anything. And this is, I, I took picture of them doing the livelihood uh, activity. So now uh, the, the person who smiled to her husband out there, she be, used uh, to be our patient, but now she becomes the facilitator of the group, identify patient and helping other patient. And she do it uh, until now six years. And I just visited her last month to take the picture. So we try to develop all the standard, standardized manual so that it can be scanned up. We can use the manual to teach other places, other people. So we be invited to work with the medical university in Hanoi to uh, develop the training curriculum for medical students. And also, we invited by WHO in Vietnam to develop the men mental health care, especially the depression chapter. So this is our next step. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And our next speaker, Peter Badamark Yaro, is from Basic Needs another chapter of Basic Needs in Ghana, and he will speak about uh, his good work there. Peter? Thank you, Joss. Uh, I'm very privileged to sit by you, knowing that you and Chris have done quite tremendous work in promoting mental health and in the treaty and convention. Uh, little did I know I'll get this opportunity, so I'm very excited. And to take over from my sister and colleague in the field of basic needs, you might find similarities, just as uh, those of Dr. Uh, Dorji. For basic needs Ghana, uh, you may be wondering, basic needs, as Tam mentioned, was founded by uh, Chris Underhill, but we have since grown into independent national organizations and so Basic Needs Ghana is 
a nationally registered NGO in Ghana that is implementing the model for mental health and development, which is the main implementation approach of the organization. We are a pioneer mental health and development advocacy organization in Ghana, and nearly uh, 15 uh, to 16 years now, we have been working to promote uh, mental health care services for people. Um, I summarize our work as generating demand for community-based mental health care services and promoting the supply for services for people who require them. Because our vision is that people with mental illness or epilepsy live in dignity and satisfy their basic needs and exercise their basic rights. And the model simply is grounded in the community setting where all community resources are mobilized. So it's not very expensive since it maximizes what already exists in individuals, in families, in communities, in wider society to support persons with mental illness, access treatment, uh, build resilience for rehabilitation within the community, and mix their acceptance a matter of course because they are not being repatriated from an institution to say, you are well, so we are bringing you back. But they have seen the road of the recovery of the person, the journey of the person within, among their own families, how agitated or violent he was and looking unkempt to how now he is very calm, a member of the family, taking his day-to-day -day chores, uh, taking his bath, having clean clothes, and being able to participate in discussions. I think this is a, an all too common uh, situation, just as my colleague Tam mentioned, that uh, mental health care services in most part of our world, in low and middle income countries, are very limited. Uh, he was talking about a 90% treatment gap, and it's about the same. And so uh, you find out that it is so because there are inadequate trained personnel, from psychiatrists to clinical psychologists to occupational therapists, social workers. There is inadequate infrastructure. The available ones are archaic. They were what was left behind by the colonial authorities. So you have uh, prison-like uh, mental health uh, psychiatric hospitals and almost uh, next to nothing, community-based mental health care services that don't even have uh, proper observation rooms for people with acute situations. And when it comes to resource deployment, it's very, very low. Less than 10% of the health budget is dedicated to mental health. And uh, I said the reasons for these are quite clear. Stigma is one. Negative perceptions. There is fear. There is helplessness. People shop around treatment until they are almost giving up. They've given up, they used up everything they have, especially if they get hooked by uh, traditional healers, which is very pronounced in Ghana because of the limited formal mental health care services. Uh, herbal and fit based practitioners cannot fill the gap. Some with successes, but there are also excesses. Um, the successes are the uh, understanding of the sociocultural environment of the society, uh, what keeps people going. They understand the cultural nuances, the traditional values, and they are able to empathize and able to communicate. They have time for people. But there are also others who want to do, uh, engage in practices that their skills and knowledge do not meet. And so they tend to use unorthodox measures to do that, including chaining or shackling people because they do not know how to calm aggressive patients who come in very acute state. And that results in human rights abuses. And as you know, in Ghana, we are highly religious. So we rely a lot on what our faith-based and the uh, practitioners, whether they are traditional healers, they are malams, or they are uh, pastors, 
of the Bible, uh, they, they gain the, the trust of most of their followers. So you tend to have a lot of them trooping there. And so by the time somebody comes to the psychiatric hospital, he would have shopped around a number of healers and uh, pastors and the rest. And they may come in some bit of chronic state and that gives some bit of work to be done to help the person stabilize. So what have we done? Basic needs, as I said, is generating the demand. And so by working actively in communities to begin the conversation on mental illness, something that initially may be taught as a taboo subject, to say we want to speak with people with lived experiences and their primary caregivers and families. Come tell us what has been your world as a mentally ill person and what are your aspirations? What can you do for yourself? And what can you do with the support of others? But from the supply side, which is the focus of this discussion, have been to build the needed skills and competencies by non-specialist cadre of health workers to complement the few psychiatrists that we have and community psychiatry nurses that are available. So a, a, a kind of task shifting, task sharing model of making it possible for persons with mental illness to get some first line of diagnosis before they reach specialists like Manoush, who can give that level of diagnosis and some first line of treatment pending a review of a psychiatrist which we bring around. So part of that is training the generalists and equipping them with a basic manual we call the Essential Skills to Mental Health Care, which was put together by a psychiatrist, an easy to use step-by-step -step, um, document that you can use for most of the common mental disorders, uh, including depression, anxiety, um, and the rest, yes. And also supporting with uh, equipment means of transport, a motorbike for the community worker to get in there, for the community volunteer to do the family visits, but also to support organization of peer support groups, to share their own stories, to laugh together, to cry together, to sing together, to talk about the things their families do to them that are not good, and how supportive others are, how the community now see them as a result of their recovery. You know, and that brings them together and mobilizing them for more action and unified voice to engage with their local authorities. But we also use that, as uh, Tam was talking about, to support livelihoods activities, vocational skills training, apprenticeships, learning a, a new work that you did not have, or picking up a new job because of your work, I mean, your situation, you might not be able to go back to formal employment as a teacher, a banker, and the rest, but to do something else. Um, so these are some of the things people are engaged in. And then we do a lot of awareness creation, uh, working with school-based mental health club as part of the prevention and promotion parts of the creating awareness and reducing stigma. Well, for challenges, we are there. Uh, there are issues of uh, funding challenges, inadequate funding support, and we need to work more with others to scale up uh, work. I think I would like to end by thanking our donors who have been of support to us, particularly the British government uh, and many others that have been part of our journey in Ghana. And I also think Tank Zero Project because they are giving us a network to, 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 to build those, the links for further engagement with others. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Peter. That was terrific, and everybody's been great. I'm turning this over now to Manoj Kumar, the Mental Health Action Trust, where he's the founder and the main leader of. So Manoj, tell us about your work and your vision. I just do want to say that what we're trying to do here is connect to the, use the power of this treaty to get more resources to the mental health sector because it's very much lacking. Good afternoon all. Thank you, Josh, for the kind introduction. 
And a big thanks to the Zero Project for um, including the issues above, about psychosocial disability in this fantastic conference about disabilities. Uh, I represent an organization called MHAT, Mental Health Action Trust. And what I'll do is to, uh, as others have done, to take you through a short introduction, describe the model, the impact it has had, and what we see as the current challenges and what might be the challenges for the future. Uh, I also uh, would like your opinion later on um, whether you think this model is uh, applicable in different settings other than uh, ours. So the background of, uh, of our work is that it is set in Kerala, which is the small, uh, tiny, la long piece of land on the southwest corner of India. Peter and others have mentioned about the global situation about uh, mental health issues. Um, in India, everything is magnified uh, because we, in terms of population, we are in a separate uh, league of our own. So all the, prob all the problems are uh, multiplied. But whatever Peter and others have said stands good for us. And globally, we must not forget that for the last 20 years, we have known that in terms of the global burden of disease, uh, neuropsychiatric conditions are uh, in the first, uh, occupy the first six, uh, occupy six of the ten, first 10 places. So in terms of burden of disease, in terms of morbidity, in terms of the cost of society, neuropsychiatric conditions are in the are six of the top 10. Depression itself is the number two. So multiply all that by our, uh, the magnitude of the problems. In Kerala, we, we are one of the small states, but we are highly densely populated. We have about close to 900 people per square kilometer. Our population is about the size of uh, Ghana um, and probably a third of the uh, population of Vietnam. Uh, I think uh, the whole population of Bhutan uh, will uh, occupy just one, one uh, the city that I live in. Uh, so our problems are, are huge. And needless to say, there is a huge mismatch of uh, need uh, and the resources available. The other problem with our mental health care system is that there is huge social inequities because most of the available resources are concentrated in uh, cities and we have uh, most of the resources in the private sector so that people have to pay out of pocket, not insurance funded, but out of pocket expenses. Apart from that, most of the care is confined to uh, prescription of medicines and that biomedical model, as we all know, is what has given psychiatry a bad name and it is grossly inadequate. We do know that that alone doesn't suffice. We need psychosocial care, psychosocial interventions, support for families, groups, group therapies, and above and all, community-based rehabilitation. In the background of this is my own personal story. I was working in the UK for about 15 years in the NHS, and then about 10 years ago, I went back to start this uh, initiative. And part of that is because of the success of the various Kerala models or Kerala paradoxes that some of you may have heard about, which is that for a low-income country, we have high social indicators. It's more nuanced than that, but in basically that is it. And we have had a long history of people's involvement in various uh, aspects of our life, in the literacy movement, in, and now of late in the health movement as well. So that was the inspiration. Uh, and the aim of MHAT was to uh, develop a set of services for the rural, mostly rural and semi-rural poor people, entirely free at the point of delivery and uh, involving uh, local partners. So we needed to innovate. So that is how we started our journey 10 years ago. And central to understanding our model is the concept that it is completely decentralized. We have 55 centers built up over the last 10 years across eight districts of the small state of, of Kerala. And these are local partners most of whom have approached us after hearing about our work, and they are equal and autonomous. We set the quality standards, we set 
many of the guidelines on what care should be provided. But within that, they have a lot of individual freedom and autonomy. We do not franchise the MHAT model. We, we prefer to be behind the scenes. And that is because it will be sustainable in the long run only if ownership is there by the local groups. And central to our uh, modus operandi is task sharing, already mentioned. Essentially, we make use of the few professional people that we have by uh, training others, non-professional mental health workers, in the delivery of mental health care. And as I said, it is comprehensive not just in uh, the traditional psychological services, but also in that we provide the service within the context of social, social development. There can be no mental health programs standing in isolation. If people are starving, then nothing else uh, is more important than that. So we empower communities, we encourage them to look after the mentally ill in their own settings. Nobody is hospitalized, it is entirely community and home-based, and we leverage technology in a big way. The only psychiatrist, as uh, somebody mentioned in the morning, the downside of uh, Zero Project is that uh, the only psychiatrist in MHAT is away in Vienna, but we are managing very well because of the use of technology. Uh, because of the time difference, I am able to get up in the morning, uh, supervise all the work which is happening there over WhatsApp and uh, Skype, uh, and we have an electronic database which generates prescriptions so I can continue to supervise my work wherever I, in the world I am, provided there are good telecommunication facilities. Uh, all this leads to the fact that stigma gets hugely reduced. All these centers are not labeled as psychiatric centers, but as community centers, and the people who are looking after uh, people with mental disabilities are members of the same community. So over time, we find that stigma is hugely reduced. So, <clears throat> um, so in terms of our reach, we look after at any point in time around four and a half thousand people. Um, and that is across the eight districts and 55 centers. What are our current challenges? Mainly with the, uh, with the mindset, we receive very little support from professional groups. This model is still not looked upon as the right model. In a society where the doctor, everything is doctor-centric, uh, it is a big challenge to convince people that task-sharing models can work equally well. And my plea to the international community is to help us with evaluating our project and also with uh, providing evidence of such task sharing models. We need to convince the uh, powers be that this is the model that will work. Um, we thought we were uh, getting somewhere by replacing the, pow the power structures within psychiatry by moving uh, care from the institutions to the community, but we find that we come up against new power structures in, in the local uh, teams that we help, that we work with. So it's a long process of uh, convincing people about this, and of course financial limitations are there. We are a non-profit organization dependent on uh, donations, and uh, uh, the financial constraints are huge. So what do we see for the future? If we go on at this rate, the gap that my colleagues have spoken about will continue to widen. Mental health care, unless it reaches to large sections of the population, will undermine whatever other successes that as humanity we have made. And for this, we need to leverage technology. We are at the right point in history where that is possible, and we need to innovate, we need to bring in ideas. We need to make mental health care the business of everybody, not just the professionals. And we are all in it together. We play roles as patients or uh, carers or as caregivers, but those are all different roles that we play. All of us should get involved in order that we can make a difference to this traditionally neglected uh, group of people with severe disabilities. Thank you all for a patient hearing. Thank you, Manoj. I'm delighted to say that our kind timekeepers told us we have a little extra time, and I really do welcome questions. I'm just going to just say a couple of words, and then I really want to hear, hear from you. Um, one thing that I, I think is important to say is we've been hearing in some of the low-income countries where there's lack of mental health services about traditional healers. Well, you know, we in Western countries, more developed countries, we're also still learning about the mind. When I was a young man, uh, schizophrenia 
was considered, and this was in the DSM, the Medical Manual of Conditions, the cause was what they called refrigerator mothers. Uh, this is only 30 years ago. Uh, so we have to be humble. Uh, being gay was also in the DSM until about 10 years ago as a medical condition. So all of us have to be humble when we hear stories in developing countries about traditional healers and all that. We, we're all still struggling to find out to heal our loved ones. Second thing I want to say is uh, in Osh, when you go to the UN, uh, see if you can have a session about the, the constructive work you're doing. As you probably know from the time before, what you hear are sessions on the abuse of psychiatry. We want to hear stories about the uses uh, of psychiatry. The last thing I want to say is I think one of the reasons the uh, people who are working on the treaty and its fulfillment have some trouble with this is, what does psychosocial disability mean? Well, I would say what it is is we're, it, it, it's not a transitory thing, it le but it's something which leads to a, 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 a inability to function in society. Just like if you don't have a wheelchair, you can't function and go places. This is the same kind of thing, and I think we need to uh, use that. So with that, I'd like to turn this over to you after a round of applause for our brave speakers, and I hope in Ocean others here you'll try to form alliances these are lonely people in in their field and they they need uh, you need to all come together Taz, you in the back you are also doing this wonderful work we need to all work together and and pressure the powers uh to be to educate them okay questions please let's please in the back yes identify yourself and uh, i'm anna kudiyarova from kazakhstan and I have two questions, one to big country, India, and one to another, my colleagues from Bhutan, Ghana, and Vietnam. As far as I know, in Bhutan, Ghana, and Vietnam, there is no psychoanalytical group or society, but I wonder if your countries have some good uh, psychological faculty, psychological universities, because psychologists can be like bridge between medical psychiatrists and psychoanalysts. And for India, my question is, I didn't understand maybe something wrong with my mind, but what is using of technology in Kerala? Not in uh, using by you in England or in US, but how you, your average or ordinary people use technology in Kerala. Okay. Thank you. Should I go first? Please. Oh, uh, I'm very, very grateful to George who invited me to this session because you, you know that I love psychoanalysis and mental health is my big, big love. Well, we're, you're in Vienna where Sigmund Freud did a lot of his early work, so enjoy. <laughs> okay, thank you for your question. We use technology in many ways on a day-to-day -day basis. What I didn't have time to explain that each of our patients are linked with a community mental health worker, someone from their own community. And depending on their interest and abilities are trained to act at the basic level or at higher levels. Higher levels would, for example, mean um, running the rehabilitation services. So primarily, each patient has access to a mental health worker. So day in, day out, 24 hours a day, they are encouraged to contact this key person, the key worker, if there are any problems. As soon as the key worker is al uh, alerted, we get a phone call. So the, the importance is that it's the fastest response service that I am aware of, so that we can nip problems in the bud. So by the use of a simple telephone contact, we are able to monitor all the people in our community and provide support to them. That is one bit. So I would field phone calls from the volunteers, the community mental health workers, from my own team out in the community, and therefore be able to manage. For all this to happen, we need systems. We have a good electronic database, which also generates a prescription. So every week, uh, each of these centers has a clinic. Obviously, as the uh, only doctor, I can't be there on the ground. So I use video conferencing and telephone to monitor what happens in the, uh, in the clinics. And 
using the electronic database. As soon as they upload information, I check it. I check the prescription and I generate an electronic prescription. So by the use of uh, video conferencing, telephone, and an electronic database, we are able to ensure that the quality is high despite not having medical professionals uh, at the forefront. We, we work with a lot of uh, psychiatric social workers and uh, clinical psychologists. E though psychoanalysis is not exactly what we do, it's more uh, cognitive behavior based and uh, problem solving therapies and so on. Other comments from the panel on this uh, question? I'll, I'll start. To, um, th thanks for the question. Uh, we have been having volunteers coming from the US and uh, most English speaking countries, especially clinical psychologists. For the past uh, six, seven years now that we have started, we have two groups of volunteers from the U.S. and English-speaking countries. We have started clinical counseling, four-year clinical counseling course in our university, and the first batch is going to graduate this summer. So, and they are actually trained hands-on in the in the outpatient and ward setting, and also uh, quite uh, embedded in our cultural context as well. As you know. A lot of the psychoanalytic and the, even some of the modern uh, the psychological theories, uh, sometimes we have difficulty uh, embedding in a very traditional culture. Uh, so we, we, are, we are actually trying to amalgamate these two systems together. On the other hand, we, have, we are you know, a Vajrayana Buddhist country, and uh, there are a lot of Buddhist concepts which are also very pro-mental um, health uh, promotion uh, and then we, we're trying to use them as well. Uh, in terms of technology, actually, you'll be surprised that we jumped that uh, technology uh, obstacle and now 95, 97% of our people are using mobile and half of them will be using Android phones. So we, we are quite accessible in terms of our communication with, with our peripheral health workers. Thank you. Other, other questions? I know, please, please. Israel, um, I thought about the necessity that drove you to um, work in the community. And I would like to hear a little bit more about the, the, the connections that were created in the community and how that, that support the people that you give services to. More specific, if it's possible. <laughs> well, uh, for more connection, I'll put it at three levels. One is the individual uh, himself who begins to build friendships because he was isolated, he was seen to be uh, dirty and unkempt and should be avoided as much as possible. He could be violent to himself and to others, who is beginning to make connections to have a significant other to deal with. Then the acceptance and support from the family, who even remind him of his medications, that he needs to take his medications his next visit, or he shouldn't wander away, far away, because a community volunteer would come, who now want to engage him in their conversations. And the wider neighbor and societal level where they begin to see him at social gatherings, be they weddings, be they naming ceremonies, be they funerals, and they do not tell him, leave this place, but accept him and even welcome him warmly and willing to engage him. These are the more specific uh, connections that I've made that begin to help in the recovery of the person. And I think what we all did not talk about, I mean, very pronounced, I think Manoj did, is that it's now, and Tam did, it's not beyond just medicines to making use of the social networks and the connections to help the person in the stabilization and recovery process. Yeah. Because what we find here in Israel is that taking medication is very important, but when you're alone, nothing helps eventually. And you, you, find, you found a way to do both of them out of necessity and, and give the emotional support and the social support and the m medication. It's, uh, very much well, so, very yes. much. And I also to connect with the issue of the psychologist. Unfortunately, uh, I have to confess that until just probably 10 years ago, 
uh, psychologists were not part of the cadre of health workers in Ghana, unfortunately. Even though we have universities that produce psychologists, clinical psychologists, social psychologists, medical psychologists, I mean, uh, all kinds of uh, levels of psychologists, they were not included. But thankfully, they are now there, and they've been given quite a good grade, almost near to a physician. So that recognition has been made, belated though. There's also a Ghana National Association of Psychologists, which is mobilizing all psychologists to do that. But before then, it was only in the military and the security facilities that you are likely to get a clinical psychologist for attention. But that has been corrected, and we are quite happy with that. However, their numbers are still small because they tend to treat, apply their trade outside Europe and North America because as at that time, they were not valued. So beyond being university lecturers, you don't find them in the mainstream social uh, health and social welfare services, but they are beginning to come and get their pride of place. So that's welcome news. Thank you. Vietnam is pretty much the same as Peter mentioned. We do have the university that provide training for psychologists, but it's not clinical psychologists. So they, they feel very not confident to provide treatment. And especially uh, psychiatrists do receive some uh, training on psychoanalytic because we under the French for so long. So this is come from the French. But uh, it's not country appropriate. So to be honest, no, no real practice in Vietnam. And if you mention about scanability, it's very difficult to scan. So if we use uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and in my project, I only use behavior activation, make people feel more energy, more active, and we do uh, problem solving therapy. It's easier to teach, easier to supervise, and simple enough for people with uh, non-medical background, very little training to learn <coughs> and to practice. So that is our strategy, so that we can provide uh, support to as many people as possible. I would just add one other thing. In the United States, uh, there was a movement to take uh, the use of therapy as exclusively done by doctors, to give it more to social workers and others. You don't need a medical degree to be a good listener and a good caregiver. Uh, and so community health workers can do a tremendous amount, uh, and uh, yes, they can't provide medications, but in Manusha's case, he can do that remotely. But we don't want to limit uh, services because we're hung up on, well, this person doesn't have the degree. Uh, that's been, I, I think, a mistake we want to avoid making. Please. Hello. So we work with the women with visual impairment. And uh, in the last seven or eight years of my working there, I've uh, witnessed one woman who was also schizophrenic. And uh, we tried working with her for two years, but were not able to. Uh, the problems that we faced were that she would uh, throw tantrums when we tried to train her on uh, vocations. She wouldn't want to go to the classes. And we tried consulting another organization. But our problem was that we had um, 35 other blind women who were staying in the same facility. And it was not uh, physically possible for the, for the resident staff to handle one person separately and the others. So um, I know I was just looking for solutions because we actually sent that person back. And her, she didn't have parents. And her brother didn't want to keep her with, uh, with his family. And uh, so she was sent back to another institution again for the blind. And uh, not necessarily uh, we would know how to kind of, uh, so I'm just uh, searching for some, some solutions to this. Um, I think the major problem is that whichever profession we are in, including doctors, we're not trained to help people with psychosocial disabilities. It's invisible. 
Mm? And uh, because it manifests as behavioral issues, we are completely in the dark about how to help people with psychosocial disabilities, and therefore, we, we shunt them and we, we send them back to institutions and so on. So what is lacking in your situation is both the family as well as your team uh, did not have the sufficient psychosocial um, background or training to know how to help someone with such disabilities. And which is why uh, that one of the things that we focus on is training. We offer a lot of short-term courses uh, to members of the public, families, um, so that uh, people become not just aware, but become skilled in dealing with such people. Because in our experience, most families, almost all families are happy to look after their um, relative with psychosocial disability if they know how to. And if they get support from a local team like ours, people are more than happy to keep their loved ones with them. Nobody wants to be in institutions. As you know, in India, the condition of institutions is rather can be rather dismal. So nobody wants to be in, ho in hospitals or mental institutions or any institutions. So the key is to spread uh, the knowledge and skills, democratize mental health literacy is what we uh, think should happen. That's a great expression, democratize mental health literacy. Yeah. We, you need to copyright that. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts? Is it, oh, please, please, I'm sorry. You. Thank you very much. I think this is more a law-related rela question, but I'm really curious to know how your respective countries, please, are dealing with this issue. Because in some countries, mental health issues are not protected by the UN Convention. And in other countries, this is the opposite. Even if they refer to these issues as mental health or psycho social, social psychological uh, deficiency, uh, they do protect such situations according to the convention. So in practice, in real terms, in real world, how is this issue dealt in your respective countries, please? Anyone want to answer? Yeah. Um, I, I hope I have gotten you right. Um, and I think uh, that's why Josh was talking about we making the <coughs> treaty, uh, the CRPD, more reflective of psychiatric support because it was from a point of view of resistance to psychiatric services. But I also do know that the WHO has also come up with the Quality Rights Project. The Quality Rights Project mainly is to help uh, countries revise and reform their psychiatric practices from a rights point of view, from the point of legal capacity, from the point of will and preferences, not in the best interest of the persons. And I think with the rule out of uh, quality rights, and if people from countries, for that matter, take them and reform their services, you have a much more user-centered, focused, rights-based response to mental health care services. And I think that would be the, the way to go. We have one more minute. Anybody else want to? Uh, oh, what, another question here. I'm sorry, I don't. Please. Um, I, I work in Zambia with Lena Cheshire, and we work in the education sector where we try, we're promoting inclusive education. And in a project that we recently started in the eastern province of Zambia, I went around um, schools that we had selected just to find out what's happening in the schools. And we found that children with um, uh, mental health um, um, issues and psychosocial um, issues were being chased out of schools. And when I also looked at, at, at previous work that we've done, 
I also realize that we haven't done well to ensure the enrollment of children um, you know, that are experiencing these um, 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 challenges. And I would like to find out from your community work experience how you, you've worked with um, schools um, or how you've worked with, with um, children with disabilities that are um, attending school and, and, and facing these. Um, yeah, and I think I'm going to cut you off because we have to leave. But you please come up after and talk to our panelists. But a quick answer, first answer to this uh, on education and uh, how children can, can be, be helped. Well, in, in Ghana, with the support of the with the support of the National uh, Institute of Mental Health of the USA and the Brown uh, School of Social Work of the Washington University, we are engaging in a project on behavioral problems of children in okay, schools. Okay, I have to cut yeah. you off. Thank you all. Please come up. Please exchange cards. Let's really move this along. That's an important part of the treaty that needs a lot of uh, work. Thank you so much for your attention and your very great questions. Thank you, panelists, for your hard Thank you, work. Thank you.